Hello dear participants of the summer school. I am warmly welcoming at this fascinating activity and I hope you to get the best possible educational outcome of this event. And today we are going to talk about digital transformation of the power industry. Actually, it is the main topic of today's lecture covering either classical power industries and the issues of up-to-date industry transformation. Uh, just a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Stanislav Yeroshenko. I'm the leading lecturer of Ural Power Engineering Institute of Ural Federal University. So, and I will be your chief lecturer within the framework of the series of lectures dedicated to machine learning within the framework of the summer school. Um, inside this lecture, we are going to cover the issues uh, which can be characterizing power industry today like how the industry is arranged, what are the major stakeholders and parties, um, how it's typically uh, the technological process is arranged, and we'll touch industry transformations and industry transition trends dealing with implementation of renewable energy sources, digital transformation of the power industry, covering artificial intelligence, big data issues, and others. So, please be attentive. First of all, let's start about uh, some general background uh, about power industry today. What are the main trends and what are the strategic plans for developing the power industry for the upcoming decades? To start with, let me briefly introduce you the basic concept of classical bulk power industry, which can be related to any country, to any industry worldwide. Well, typically, Within the framework of power industry uh, actuation, uh, we have this structure associated with uh, power production at big power generation sites. It means that we produce millions, billions of megawatt hours uh, at bulk power generation sites. In order to transmit this power, we use high voltage transmission lines. And in this figure, it is depicted in blue. Um, transmission lines and um, long distance transmission networks are used to transmit big amounts of energy, of electric energy, over long distances. Actually, um, when we uh, pass uh, transmit electric energy over the long distance, we finally come down to the distribution network. And the role of the distribution network is to distribute those big amounts of electric energy among the customers. Uh, at this diagram, you may see substation step-down power transformer and the corresponding customers, which um, may be related to industrial activities, commercial activities, or simple residential customers connected to secondary networks. Well, actually, this is the general idea of how the power industry works. So we have bulk power plants, high voltage transmission lines to transmit those big generated amounts of electrical energy over long distance. Then we have distribution networks. And finally, we go to the customers. Um, just a few words about the power industry today. Up-to-date power industry can be characterized by the global processes. And um, I do believe that these processes shape the novel future of the industry in general. Uh, first of all, it's decarbonization. Uh, it refers to the reduction or elimination of carbon dioxide emissions from the energy sources. Um, secondly, it's digital transformation. Um, digital transformation or digitalization is a general term um, actually, it, it was borrowed from social sciences or economic sciences, but it can be referred to power industry as well. It means implementation of digital technologies into the technological process from the point of view of control, protection, monitoring, etc. Then we pass to demand response, and um, actually demand response equals to decreasing of energy consumption and may be really uh, related to energy efficiency. 
Well, actually, the reduction of energy consumption of the basis of technological, economic, or some sort of behavioral changes, uh, they may ensure a higher standard of comfort, or at least uh, keep the existing comfort at the same level, but reduce the energy consumption by the final customers. Uh, then we move on to decentralization and decentralized energy system is characterized by multiple energy production facilities uh, which are allocated closer to the site of energy consumption. A decentralized energy system allows for more optimal use of renewable energy as well as combined heat and power. Actually, by implementing decentralized energy systems, we ensure reliability of power supply, energy security, by allocating multiple energy sources, etc. Well, and finally, we move on to disintermediation. And uh, actually, what does it mean? Generally, it can be treated as a process that provides customers with direct access to services or information that would otherwise require um, a so called mediator. So, for example, if we address the wholesale market, um, a mediator could be a wholesaler, yes, or just the energy trading company, uh, which provides uh, energy trading service for the customers within the framework of retail market. So it's just an example for the industry. Uh, now let's focus in a little bit more detail on decarbonization. And um, I would say that the previous concept presented in the previous slide, maybe you've noticed that um, actually all of the trends and processes associated with up-to-date industry started with D. And as far as we have these five D processes, um, I would say that the concept of industry transformation may be referred to as Penta D, yeah, or five Ds. Uh, and the concept of decarbonization is one of the Ds yes, to be addressed in a more detailed way. The concept of decarbonization is typically understood uh, as utilization of renewable energy collecting from carbon natural sources like sunlight, wind, rain, waves, geothermal heat, whatever. Like there are many technologies uh, addressing um, green and renewable energy sources. However, there are many other features characterizing decarbonization trends, like introduction of heating and cooling systems, which ensure efficient energy consumption, including those based on renewable energy sources as well. Maybe you've noticed there may be solar collectors of heat installed at the roofs of the residential customers, and they serve um, as like heaters of water in the, in the houses. Uh, well, next, developing of green mobility, which aims to reduce both and air and noise pollution from transport and to address climate change in the transport sector. Next, we move on to carbon dioxide capturing, which actually addresses climatic changes issues as well. And uh, carbon wastes can be captured directly from industrial source by using a variety of technologies, including absorption, membrane gas separation or gas hydrate technologies or others. And finally, decarbonization um, associated with policy and regulation. Um, actually, it became a top priority of the governments and policymakers worldwide. And actually, it is not the last, but I would say maybe the first point of consideration because the policy and regulation in the sphere of decarbonization provide the corresponding incentives, um, the corresponding motivation to implement and use the technologies providing decarbonization of the global economy. Well, now let's try to put decarbonization issue to a little bit more scrutiny. And I want to focus your attention on the results extracted from the report entitled Renewables 2020 Global Status Report, produced by REN21 uh, Analytical Company. And uh, the first point to focus on is estimated renewable energy share of total final energy consumption, which was monitored in 2018. Well, actually, about 80% of energy sources used to cover the energy needs of the humanity 
associated with um, usage of the fossil fuels. And only 11% are associated with renewable energy sources. Actually, we do have about 2% given for wind, solar, biomass, and ocean power. About 1% provided for biofuels for transport. Uh, about 4% for hydropower and about 4% of, of using biomass, solar, and geothermal for heating of, uh, of the houses, of the buildings. Being a little bit more specific about the types of the industries, which are the most, I would say, energy intensive, um, well, let's consider uh, the following reported um, figures. Well, about 51% of energy is used for thermal uh, purposes. Actually, it's used for heating of buildings, houses, uh, for providing industrial heat um, for some industrial purposes and to support the technological processes of the industry as well. And 32% actually go to transport and only 17% go to power supply of the customers. Actually, if we consider the share of renewable energy sources in these different types of energy, I would say major energy consumers, um, well, for thermal purposes, for heating purposes, we have about 10% of renewable energy it means that 90% stands for non-renewable energy. Um, for transport, we have only about 3% of renewable energy applied for these purposes. And the power consumption, so actually more related to power industry, stands for about 26% of renewable energy application. Now let's move on to more detailed consideration of renewable energy sources application in various spheres. Uh, well, as it was noticed from the previous slides, transport stands for about 32% of final energy demand. And actually at the moment we have about 97% of renewable energy used for transportation purposes. And only about 3% of renewable energy, which are divided uh, into 3% standing for biofuels application and about 0.3% of renewable electricity, like solar panels or something else. Being a little bit more specific about decarbonization trends, I would like to focus your attention on the rate of growth of renewable energy sources by technologically and total starting from 2013 till 2019. Uh, first uh, of all, I would like to draw your attention primarily to the growth of solar photovoltaic power plants capacities. And um, well, in total, um, I mean standing for all technologies, photovoltaic power plants, wind, hydro, biofuels, etc. So in 2019, we had about 200 gigawatts addition of installed capacities of renewable energy sources, which actually look quite promising from the point of view of getting green, clean power system. Uh, well, which stands for uh, photovoltaic technology, we have about uh, 110 gigawatts of installed capacity. And you may notice a steady growth of implementation of renewable energy sources from year to year. Actually, from one point of view, it looks like very promising and uh, very optimistic. Uh, from other point of view, we are, as um, IT specialists, power engineers, we have to focus on peculiar features of renewable energy sources application in the power industry because they provide the corresponding technological effect on the power system. And we will focus uh, on some effects um, introduced by renewable energy sources in the forthcoming slides of this lecture. Um, before uh, analyzing the impact of renewable energy sources on the power system, first of all, <clears throat> let me introduce you, I would say, the leaders of investment in, in renewable power and fuels. 
uh, by country and region uh, from 2007 till 2017. Um, well, the leader in implementing and um, investing into renewable energy technologies uh, is China. Uh, then we move on to Europe. On the third place goes to United States of America. Uh, anyway, we have uh, very high, uh, high important parties and high important players on the renewable energy market, which are the South American countries, India, Brazil, Africa, and others, which in total, yes, produce like billions of investments uh, annually to support renewable energy sources implementation. Well, as I've promised to you, let's try to focus on the impact of renewable energy sources on the power system. And first of all, I would like to draw your attention to the very first scenario, which corresponds to the, I would say, classical fuels and power balance in the energy system. And uh, before analyzing the presented curves, let me focus your attention on what is a energy consumption curve of the power system. You may see it in dark red, yes, so it's like the upper curve uh, provided for all of the three scenarios. It's in the upper side, yep. And I would say that this curve is not smooth, yes, so we have always changes uh, associated with the uh, changes in the energy consumption in the power system. So why it happens? Actually, it's quite understandable as it comes uh, typically from the human space of life, yeah, and we see the minimal energy consumption corresponding to the night hours. Actually, it's quite natural because during the night hours, the majority of the people sleep and um, the production processes slow down, yes, and uh, we see the acceleration in the energy consumption in the morning hours, for example, starting from six o'clock to eight o'clock in the morning. And at eight o'clock, uh, we may have uh, so-called peak loading conditions. As far as, well, the people wake up, the production processes start to accelerate, etc. Then we have some slowing down in lunchtime, yeah? And um, again, acceleration in evening hours, because we come back to homes, switch on TVs, electric ovens, um, I don't know, like refrigerators, um, like electric teapots, etc. So, and then the energy uh, consumption uh, starts to decrease in the late evening hours. So, uh, the energy consumption curve of the power system, yeah, it generally corresponds to the people's pace of life. But um, the question is, how we cover, I mean, how the power system covers the energy needs of the consumers. And this concept can be divided into different types of the, um, like say, different types of the participation of the generation facilities in uh, energy consumption curve coverage. And the first type is base load. Yeah, and base load is provided in the upper uh, figure in dark gray. Yeah, and typically for base load coverage, we use not so flexible, uh, low manures uh, power generation facilities, which have the corresponding technologies. And for base load energy consumption coverage, we typically use coal fired power plants or nuclear power plants. Well, it is naturally known that it is not really uh, sometimes safe, even safe, uh, to like to fluctuate the energy production of nuclear power plants. So they are highly uh, demanded, yes, to work in such like stable mode. Yes, and when to ensure uh, smooth energy generation from nuclear power plants and uh, coal-fired power plants as well. The next part, um, which is typically called half-peak, or here it's called intermediate and dispatchable generation, yeah, it's given in light gray, corresponds to more flexible, more manures power plants, which are typically natural gas fired or oil fired or hydropower generation as well. Um, for these types of the power plants, we have some certain technical requirements, which correspond to um, like 
more uh, fast response in terms of the regulation of the energy output because we are to provide the control actions to slow down or to ramp up to produce less amount or greater amount of electrical energy correspondingly. And uh, the last part um, for uh, energy consumption curve coverage uh, is used for peak hours, actually. It's like the most manurous and highly flexible power generation sources, which are able to ramp up uh, in fast way and to slow down if it's needed. So it means that these types of power generation sources are always fluctuating and regulating their power generation output in order to meet the demand of the energy um, by the consumers. And well, it is the general concept and it is, I would say, the baseline scenario which we are going to use to compare the scenarios of the future associated with implementation of renewable energy sources. And now let's uh, turn to scenario number two. Scenario number two corresponds to implementation of about maybe 20-15% of renewable energy sources compared to the total installed capacity of power generation in the power system. And you may see it in yellow colors, yes. And um, actually, the general idea is that renewable energy sources are highly stochastic. Uh, first of all, they depend on the natural fuels like wind and sun, for instance. Well, it's quite understandable that during the daytime, we may use photovoltaic energy sources, but during not nighttime, we are not able to use them. Uh, moreover, it is generally known that during the night hours, we have greater wind speeds, and during the daytime, we have lower wind speeds. For this reason, we have this like um, um, variation curve, uh giving us the general understanding on how the energy output from renewable energy sources changes uh, during the 24 hours uh, this second scenario uh, generally corresponds to what's happening in some of the european countries in some of the regions of the united states of america and um, um, actually the major problem standing behind this uh, implementation of renewable energy sources is ensuring the balance of the power system because we have to provide the energy consumers with the electric energy in the most safe reliable and qualitative way and for this reason um, if we implement renewable energy sources we are no longer able to control the balance in 100 percent of cases and for this reason, um, actually, within the framework of implementation of renewable energy sources of about 20-30%, we may have some uh, shares, I would say, of, uh, of the energy consumption graph. Yes, where we may have um, excessive energy or where we may have uh, lacking energy to cover the needs of the consumers in the power system. For this reason, actually implementation of renewable energy sources is typically associated with implementation of uh, energy storage facilities, which can fast, uh, uh, fastly react uh, to the change of the balance in the power system and cover the needs of the consumers. If we have the lack of the energy, or we have some excessive energy. Um, in the upcoming years, and actually it comes from the strategy of the energy sector development, for example, of the European Union, by 2050, uh, we aim to have fully non-carbon power system. Well, actually, what does it mean from the point of view of the technology? If we have fully non-carbon power system, we fully eliminate natural gas, coal-fired power plants, oil-fired power plants as well. And um, we may face um, big difficulties with ensuring the balance um, of electrical energy in the power system. And for this reason, yeah, so we may, like, we, we would like to be very attentive, yes, from the point of view of the times of the day, which are depicted here and here, uh, which are typically associated with overproduction 
of electrical energy. This energy may be used to charge the batteries, yes, for example, to ensure electric energy stores, uh, storage, or to provide export of electrical energy to adjacent power systems where they have, for example, the lack of electrical energy. So it's like, you know, ever balancing scenario where you always have to keep in mind that you may have some changes in the balance due to some problems with, for example, photovoltaic energy production because you have some clouds. Or, for example, you have some problems with the wind speed and all of the wind generators actually slow down and you lose some um, energy production. Uh, and now you need to import yes, some energy from the adjacent power system to cover the needs of the consumers. So it's a um, highly complicated technological scenario which requires uh, implementation of uh, great storage facilities and um, I would say uh, highly, uh, highly capacitive uh, transmission network because uh, you need to ensure that you are able to transmit energy from the adjacent regions, from the adjacent countries, etc. Uh, well, I like this part of the lecture very much, and um, it really makes sense because implementation of renewable energy sources, uh, in this case, namely of photovoltaic energy sources, result in new types of system failures. And it happened in 2015 in March. Well, actually, it resulted from solar eclipse. Uh, as far as at the European uh, part um, of global power system, we have many photovoltaic uh, energy facilities and it means that actually solar eclipse uh, impacts the power system operation mode greatly and um, of course solar eclipse is uh, easy to be forecasted because well we know uh, about solar eclipses like years before yeah but um, this great solar eclipse over the european territory of the power system uh, showed that, uh, well, it required great efforts from the engineering staff of all of the countries, all of the union of the energy operators at the European zone uh, to cope with the uh, consequences of solar eclipse in 2015. Well, uh, first of all, let me focus your attention on the installed capacity uh, in 2015, of course, uh, of the European countries. Uh, in terms of uh, photovoltaic power plants. And I would like to draw your attention, first of all, maybe to Germany, because in Germany we have um, 39, um, approximately 40 gigawatts of installed capacity of photovoltaic power plants. In Italy, it's about 20 gigawatts. Uh, in Spain, about seven gigawatts. So actually these are the countries who suffered uh, from solar eclipse in a more severe way. And uh, actually because of the reduction of photovoltaic power plants production during solar eclipse. And you may notice that uh, for Germany, the total reduction of photovoltaic energy production was equal to 16.9 gigawatts. Well, it's great capacity. It's about 50% of all of the installed photovoltaic power plants. And for example, for uh, Spain, it's about 1.5 gigawatts. And uh, well, for Italy, it's about 7 gigawatts. Actually, the major problem standing behind the solar eclipse is that we lose great amount of power generation, but we have to ensure that we provide, we still provide reliable power supply uh, of the customers. And if we have lost some share of power generation, we have to ensure this generation, this electrical energy from somewhere else. Yeah. And uh, actually, it took a year uh, for the NTCOE. Actually, NTCOE is a company, it's some sort of the community comprising 50 uh, system operators from the European countries. So uh, about 50 experts work together for a year to cope with the consequences of solar eclipse over the European zone. And actually it was some sort of the emergency plan 
and this emergency plan included uh, like multiple actions associated with uh, starting of uh, fossil fuel generation covering the um, uh, lack of energy from the adjacent countries from the adjacent power systems when the solar uh, eclipse impact was the most severe and well actually the european zone and european power systems finally managed yes to withstand the solar eclipse consequences but anyway it was a great work done by the highly qualified professionals from all of the countries participating in the european union and uh well what is really important to focus on within the framework of this type of so-called new system failure new system emergency and um the greatest um the greatest consequence and i would say uh the greatest hazard which goes from solar eclipse is not just the total amount of solar energy which we lose during this uh, natural, uh, I would say, phenomena. But it is the speed, so it's the gradient of uh, dropping the, the capacity, yes, of dropping off the capacity of photovoltaic power plants and the speed of, uh, I would say, ramping up or increasing the capacity from photovoltaic power plants. So look at this table. For example, for Germany, uh the minimal uh gradient so it corresponds to the fastest way of reduction of photovoltaic power plants production uh corresponds to about 273 megawatts per minute and well that's great capacity because uh well um there are not so many uh fossil fuel generation sources who have this opportunity i mean technical uh feasibility uh to cover this imbalance resulting from uh dropping the generation capacity by 273 megawatts and when we consider the ramping up conditions so the increase the per minute increase of photovoltaic energy production corresponded to 360 megawatts so it's great capacity which cannot be covered by any other type of uh power generation source uh, what I would like to say that uh, photovoltaic power plants actually um, are some sort of unique energy sources because um, if we consider fossil fuel energy sources, we always need some time to accelerate, to increase the energy output, and we need some time to decrease energy output as well because, well, we need to ensure the technological process. So we just burn a little bit more gas, um, like increase the parameters of the steam rotate the turbine etc so it, it has some time inertia yeah and uh well it means that we are not able to ramp up and slow down immediately and photovoltaic power plant is the only type of power generation which practically has no inertia because if we immediately have this um uh, solar eclipse for example or we have some clouds maybe dead clouds the photovoltaic power plant can like drop off the generation capacity immediately and uh, well it can be uh, practically switched off from the power system and it means that actually there are no uh, fossil fuel generation sources which are able to cover this uh, deficit yes so this uh, lack of electrical energy uh, it means that we need to develop the electrical energy storage facilities which are able to cope with this scenario well i like this slide with smileys um, actually these are not emojis but uh, these are the phases of the moon just traveling in front of the sun and resulting in solar eclipse and uh, well the most cheerful smiley stands for bulgaria i suppose but the most crucial impact of the solar eclipse was finally observed in germany uh, as we have noticed and its castle yes yeah, so these measurements at the right upper side of the slide corresponds to castle germany and um, well we had some severe consequences for denmark Yes, and uh, well, some uh, significant consequences in Austria as well. Well, uh, now let's move on to decentralization 
And um, before talking about decentralization, let me firstly describe you what is actually centralization is. Uh, the flow chart presented at the left side of the slide illustrates the power industry as it is in the majority of the countries, like in the very beginning of the lecture. In a traditional centralized energy grid, um, the energy producers, the power generation plants, uh, actually the transmission grids and distribution grid operators, uh, suppliers, uh, energy traders, they all work together to provide electrical energy to the final consumers. So we have some sort of unidirectional energy flow from the generators to the consumers. Uh, if we uh, shift the paradigm and move to decentralized concept of power supply, a decentralized energy system is characterized by multiple distributed energy production facilities. Actually, in order to allow the use of decentralized flexibility, um, actually, we need some corresponding market arrangements. And um, actually, we have to design uh, this decentralized distributed energy market structures as well. Implementation of uh, small-scale power generation facilities at the industrial uh, site or at the customer side as, uh, of the meter is the first step uh, on the way to effective power decentralization. And I would say that, among other things, self-balancing um, of the power systems help to reduce the maintenance costs for transmission networks and eliminate a significant share of the energy losses. Uh, in decentralized conditions, distribution networks are under the spotlight uh, because they have to provide bidirectional energy exchanges between all of the decentralized market participants. Um, that finally means that the power system becomes really service-oriented uh, because up-to-date customers, they expect a high-quality, personalized service available 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And each customer uh, becomes an active participant and um, actually they influence, yes, and uh, provide the impact on the technological process of the power system in general. Um, being more specific about decentralization concepts as well, I would say that it provides more reliable power supply of the uh, customer's uh, electrical appliances. Because um, if we consider a centralized concept, we have very significant distances from the production sites to the consumption sites. And we may face some like damaged poles, wires due to severe weather conditions for some reason due to car accidents or some uh, intentional or occasional impacts from other infrastructures or human activities. But when we are implementing decentralized uh, principle of power supply, actually that means that each customer is uh, able to produce electrical energy by his own. And uh, this results in improvements and dramatic increase of uh, the energy security of the region, of the country as well. Uh, now let's move on to the concept of digital transformation of the power industry. So we'll talk about what is it and what are the main details and uh, features associated with digitalization of the industry. Well, digitalization is a process referred to the power industry and uh, actually it addresses the following main issues uh, first of all it's the implementation of artificial intelligence artificial intelligence is a frontier technology and is a frontline research discipline which actually aims to build the computer systems that perform tasks re uh, requiring actions um, similar to human intelligence uh, then we jump to industrial Internet of Things, which has actually become one of the pushing trends as well. And energy utilities has always used available technology to optimize and control their production assets. Increase safety, control the grid, keep the lights on in the streets as well. 
and uh, the examples of Internet of Things application in the electric power industry may be a supervisory control and data acquisition system, for example, uh, which also uh, provide uh, like collection, acquisition of uh, data of various types from various monitoring systems and sensors. Yes, data processing and uh, like um, providing the basis for the majority of the decision support making systems uh, which do exist in power industry as well. Now we move on to robotics technologies and implementation of robots into the technological process uh, actually aims to improve productivity, safety and uh, reliability of power facilities as well. And, um, well, implementation of robot technologies provide, um, I would say, mobile intelligent solutions in order to eliminate monotonous labor of the engineering staff of the energy utilities. Another emerging technology transforming the power industry's blockchain. Actually, it was uh, originated from digital currency, uh, from digital markets, but it have moved to the energy space. And well, actually the main idea is to allow the consumers, um, be they individual or commercial enterprises, to buy and sell energy directly between one another without mediators. So this uh, helps to improve uh, safety, transparency of the energy market. And it is expected that finally the implementation of such technology will uh, actually uh, influence on the tariff, on the price of electrical energy for the final customers. Well, then we can but mention industrial wireless technologies, ensuring safe, fast and reliable data transmission over the geographically distributed areas of the power system. And this sphere is mainly focusing nowadays on implementation of uh, 5G and 6G high-speed next generation communication networks. And uh, well, finally, uh, power industries data will further enrich and expand uh, resulting from the implementation of the aforementioned technologies and actually big data analytics um, well it has already taken the root of the industry and um, for this reason big data requires more detailed inspection and let's take this issue for more detailed consideration in the subsequent slides uh, well first of all let's address big data growth uh, electric utilities they go for smart grids with advanced metering uh, infrastructure and big data capabilities. And um, what is really important that the amount of data created each year is growing faster and faster than even before. It is not just for the power industry, but it for all the humanity. So just imagine social networks, like uh, big data resulting from uh, natural, uh, natural phenomena monitoring, like space monitors, um, whatever. Yeah. So there are many, many spheres uh, which produce uh, great amounts of data. And actually by 2020, uh, every human on the planet uh, was creating about two megabytes of data. Uh, <laughs> attention, please. Two megabytes of data per second. And this will finally result in 2004 uh, in about 150 zettabytes of information processed by the humanity. Well, generally, big data is typically addressed as a field that treats uh, ways how to deal with this big data set, uh, which are too large um, for traditional data processing software. And, uh, well, if um, addressing big data phenomena in more detail, the concept of triple V uh, is the most suitable one and it corresponds to the velocity, actually the speed of data creation, volume, uh, the size of data used or generated by the monitoring systems or sensors, and variety actually which corresponds to the different types and structures of data which we use, um, like which we potentially may use uh, for technological process improvement. 
before uh, passing to description of this triple B concept, let's talk about data types. Uh, actually, when we talk about data analytics, uh, we hear some words like structured, unstructured, or semi-structured data. But actually, these are main three forms of data that are relevant for all types of industrial applications. Structured data has been around for some time, and traditional systems still rely on this form of data. However, as it can be seen from the data growth curve, uh, at the moment, we typically observe the great improvement uh, in terms of the generation of semi-structured and unstructured data sources. And uh, actually, nowadays, more and more industries are now looking to take their analytics to the next level by implementing uh, software solutions which are able to address semi-structured and unstructured data analysis. Now let's jump to consideration of triple V concept in more detail. And first of all, I would like to focus your attention on the velocity of data. Um, actually, velocity is the measure of how fast the data is coming in. Uh, some certain business processes at the power industry enterprises have to address, I would say, a tsunami of data coming from various sensors and monitoring systems every second. And actually, the more the Internet of Energy takes off, the more connected sensors will be in the world and in the power systems. And actually, as the number of units increase, I mean, for example, as the number of smart meters increase, so does the data flow from these meters. And um, if we address the possible areas and the possible spheres of uh, power industry, which are somehow illustrating the velocity of data income, uh, I would really focus your attention on market and trading because uh, this, um, I would say, sphere, this branch of industrial activities uh, is associated with uh, extracting uh, and collecting like great amounts of information every second from uh, all of the monitoring systems and sensors uh, installed uh, at the um, consumer sites like energy accounting systems, etc. So moreover, uh, we may address uh, power system operation and control. And actually power system dispatch control systems are based on monitoring of uh, power system facilities as well. And they also do receive great amounts of data every second. The next point is uh, volume of data. And I would say that uh, volume is the most important V associated with big data because actually the volume can be big. And uh, what we are talking about here is the quantities of data that reach almost like incomprehensible fortunes and scales. And uh, putting the emphasis on the power industry um, just imagine the amount of incident infrastructures generating amounts of data uh, used for power system operation and control, as well as for power system planning and energy marketing. And this slide illustrates just a couple of uh, spheres, a couple of uh, technological uh, processes associated with power industry, which require big data sets, which cannot be addressed with the help of classical uh, data preprocessing approaches. And finally, we come to variety of data. Actually, depending on the source, the data type may take different forms. It's like sensor data, encrypted uh, packets, uh, weather characteristics, um, even photographs or videos. And each of these very different types uh, from like different um, data sources, actually uh, they, they differ. <laughs> and well, it means that actually they cannot be included in the simple spreadsheet of Excel file. And well, different types of data, it means that actually you need to address them differently as well. And if we turn back to the power industry, just imagine Mm, 
well, just imagine the number of different data varieties uh, that come from uh, various uh, external data sources. And, well, it's like visual data as well, because uh, we may take some photographs, analyze some videos within the framework of our system technical state estimation, for example. There is some com consumption data, and it can be represented in a form of the series of the energy consumption curve. Um, well, we have some social media as well, and we have to analyze it because um, social media reflects the pace of life of people, and it impacts the energy curve in, in the corresponding way. Well, within the framework of our today's lecture, we've been focusing on 5D concept. Actually, each of the Ds are decentralization, decarbonization, disintermediation, demand response, and digital transformation. So please feel free to use this terminology within the framework of the summer school and in your professional life. Actually, I would say that digital transformation is one of the most important Ds within the framework of this Penta D concept, maybe along with decarbonization. For this reason, your project case, the case of the summer school, is focused on implementing renewable energy sources and applying machine learning techniques to optimize the operation modes of the power system. Thank you very much for your attention. See you next time. It was Stanislav. Bye-bye.